Hello, my name is Cliff Freilich. I'm the Executive Director of Cinema St. Louis, and I'd like to welcome you to this conversation about Blacks in Cinema. Uh, it's part of Soul Cinema, Take Two, which is being presented by ARP in Missouri. Um, uh, we have a great uh, panel here to talk about the, both the legacy of uh, African Americans in film, uh, but also the contemporary scene and what the future might hold. So let me uh, again give a shout out to ARP uh, for enabling this uh, particular series. Three of the filmmakers who were on the, the call are on the Zoom are actually uh, featured in this edition of Soul Cinema and we had really good response. I know a lot of people have seen uh, their films. So uh, we're really pleased to be able to have them join us. So let me just go around. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Novotny Lawrence. He's an associate professor at Iowa State University, and he is an author of many books, uh, including Black Exploitation Films of the 1970s, Blackness and Genre. He's the editor of Documenting the Black Experience and the co-editor of Beyond Black Exploitation. Our three filmmakers, are Deborah Riley Draper. Uh, Deborah is the director of the documentaries 20 Pearls, the story of Alpha Kappa uh, Alpha Sorority, which of course was featured. Uh, also Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, and Versailles 73, American Runway Revolution. We are also joined by Alana Marie, who's the director of The Kinlock Doc, another film featured in Soul Cinema. And finally, Damian D. Smith, the director of Target St. Louis, volume one. All right, uh, that's the brief uh, version of their bios. I would like uh, now to uh, invite them all to sort of expand a little bit about their backgrounds and also what they're involved in right now, the kind of projects that they uh, are engaged in, hope to be engaged in. Let's start first with Novotny. All right, thanks Cliff, I uh, appreciate it. Uh, and thanks for having me tonight. I'm so excited about this event, this discussion, and I have to say it is a pleasure to share. Oh, the hold on, hold on, Navani. Apparently, we are. Uh, it isn't live. It says oh. please pause. Oh. So okay. we're going to wait and start again, and I will uh, say exactly the same things. I hope as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we'll and wait for. <laughs> I'm a one take guy. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you, you have to call our people now, Cliff. <laughs> Where it goes from here, you all, I have no idea. Hang with me. <laughs> They're stalking out. Uh, all right, we'll wait for Bree to respond. So we're not live yet? Uh, apparently not, although I guess we could be very surprised after the fact. So be careful what you say. It's always possible that we are live and we just don't know. Oh, I was going to just <laughs> grab water. I was like, I'm going to just get some water. <laughs> uh, you can, you can probably, you're probably safe to do so, but I don't know how long this will last. I did it. I'm done. All right, good. I'm going to grab one. One second. Yeah, I, I, I've grabbed the water, so we're good. Okay, I'm back too. <laughs> exactly. So now we're hydrated, Damien. We're hydrated. All right, here I we know. go. We're hydrated now. Okay. Hello, we had a few technical difficulties, so our apologies. We are now ready to roll. My name's Cliff Freilich. I'm the executive director of Cinema St. Louis, and we are the presenters of Soul Cinema Take Two. Uh, this is a part of that series that was presented by ARP in Missouri. We thank them for their uh, wonderful sponsorship and enabling this particular conversation to take place and also for you folks to have seen those wonderful films. Uh, this conversation is going to address Blacks in cinema, both the past, the current situation, and we hope what's going to take place in the future, at least our hopes for the future. So we have a uh, terrific panel, including three filmmakers who were involved in this year's Soul Cinema. I'm going to briefly introduce them, and then I'll ask them to also expand a bit on my very brief bios. So I'm going to start uh, with Novotny Lawrence, who's the associate professor of, uh, at, uh, not the associate professor, he's an associate professor. He's not the only person who teaches at Iowa State University. <laughs> he's the author of Black Exploitation Films of the 1970s, Blackness and Genre. 
the editor of Documenting the Black Experience and the co-editor of Beyond Black Exploitation. The three filmmakers that we have with us are Deborah Riley Draper, director of the documentaries 20 Pearls, the story of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, which was featured in Soul Cinema, but also Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, and Versailles 73, American Runway Revolution, all three of which actually played at the St. Louis International Film Festival. In addition, we have Alana Marie. Uh, she's a first time feature filmmaker who was the director of the Kinlock Doc. And finally, we have Damian D. Smith, uh, who is uh, a director of uh, the documentary Target St. Louis Volume One. Okay, uh, let's go around and let you expand slightly on my abbreviated bios to give a little bit more background on who you are, what you do, and what you might be engaged in right now. Let's start with Navabi. Thank you, Cliff. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of the event. And I have to say that I'm so pleased and excited to be on this virtual panel with, with these wonderful filmmakers. So um, hats off to all of you. And, and I can't wait to hear more about your work. Um, as Cliff said, I'm Novotny Lawrence. Um, I went to film school at the University of Kansas where I earned my doctorate majoring in film studies. And then I uh, focused on representations of Blacks in film. And that now extends over in the Blacks in popular culture. Uh, I work on any number of research projects and have worn a, a different number of hats during my time, first at Southern Illinois University and now at Iowa State University, where I'm on a joint appointment between the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication and the English Department. Um, my research has involved looking at anything from black exploitation cinema, those films from the 70s, Shaft, Superfly, Foxy Brown, so on and so forth, uh, to looking at the comedy of Dave Chappelle and problematizing some of his his uh, material as well as, you know, credit where credit is due, but asking the question, is he a comic genius or is he a con man? I've also done some work on Jordan Peele's film, Get Out. I'm currently working on a journal article on the film, Get Out, and also co-editing an anthology with Robin Armines Coleman on Blacks in Horror Cinema. Ooh. Great, and I'll put in a little plug uh, at the November St. Louis International Film Festival. Uh, Novotny is going to be returning. He's presented several films for us, but he's going to be doing Superfly as part of our Golden Anniversaries Films of 1972. All right, let's go to Alana Marie. Sure, yes. Happy Tuesday. Happy International Women's Day. Um, as I said, my name is Alana Marie. I am a Dallas-based um, documentary filmmaker, brand photographer, and digital storyteller. But by way of St. Louis, Missouri, I tell people all the time, St. Louis through and through, don't get it twisted. Um, I think I'm the, the newbie of the bunch. So I am a first-time filmmaker um, in general. I have an undergrad and a degree in communication from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a master's of social work. Uh, from Washington University in St. Louis. And that is actually where my passion for storytelling was birthed while I was pursuing my social work degree. And I tell people all the time, um, that is, I, I learned by, by visual mediums. Professors use uh, documentaries to enhance their, you know, lectures. And so I would love in the future, wink, wink, to incorporate documentary filmmaking into social work programs in the future. Um, but right now I am still riding the waves of Kenlock. I love that people outside of the city are learning about this amazing community. Um, I've been booking several uh, private screenings and hosting different Q&A sessions um, with community members. My favorite are high school students who are interested in learning about the elders and their family. And so they're doing interviews with their elders during spring breaks and holidays and learning about where their family came from and just learning how to create content with the resources they have available to them. So to me, I'm getting back to my educator social work roots by um, using my story as a as a descendant of Kenlock and also as a documentary filmmaker and storyteller of the Kenlock back. So stay tuned. I might be in your city. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to Damien. Oh, you're muted. There we go. Our Hey, how you doing, good people? I am Damian D. Smith, filmmaker, storyteller, and performer. Um, Target St. Louis Volume 1 is a passion uh, documentary that came um, from my grandmother. I'm, I'm originally from St. Louis, and she inspired this documentary. So this is 
our first feature documentary that that's come out. But right now we're wrapping up and post production in a docu series called Detangling the South, in which um, we traveled around uh, to historically historically significant places in the South and highlighted the contributions of Black women during the civil rights era that's, you know, often overlooked. And then also we got some history that was told to Black women. Um, and we took around two, um, my partner and I, my two, uh, two attorneys, a civil rights attorney and a social justice attorney, I'm sorry, and a environmental justice attorney. And when they went and interviewed and highlighted these places throughout uh, you know, Selma, the Pettus Bridge, uh, 16th Street Baptist Church, Sweet Auburn in Georgia, and we got exit polls in um, in, in Dade County, Florida. So this was also a dual dual edge sword to uh, engage voter uh, voter awareness and voter engagement. So this is uh, so that's what we're we're in like the finishing edge of post with that series, and we have another one that we shot um, in. Ghana that we started our first episode of a series that we're working on that we just shot in the Elmina Cape Coast area of Ghana. So those are the, those and that is a uh, that is an unscripted um, unscripted uh, show as well. So those are the two things that's currently happening alongside with the narrative side of of the world that we're working on uh, our first feature narrative. Well, we got two of them actually: the uh, the uh, Victory High and also uh, RIP Delete. So that's, those are a couple of things that we got going on along with other things, but I want to try to give a, cre a brief little uh, run through and stay in format. <laughs> All right, and now on to uh, Deborah Riley Draper. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to be on this panel. I am a three-time St. Louis International Film Festival official selection, so I'm really proud of that. Um, I'm happy that everyone had the opportunity opportunity to see 20 pearls. Um, right now, I'm a writer, director, um, filmmaker. I'm so excited. I'm in the Writers Guild. I'm going into my second year in the Writers Guild. And for me, that was um, a, a big accomplishment to be able to get into the Guild for, for my work. Um, so I just, and I'm just going to just spew this all out really quickly. Um, during COVID, I directed two campaigns for the Ad Council about COVID-19 education. And last week um, for the Atlanta Addies, I won four gold Addies and one bronze for that campaign. And I'm really proud to be able to bring my um, advertising chops because before I became a filmmaker, I was the vice president of a Madison Avenue agency um, in Atlanta, sort of go back to advertising as a director and I left it as an account service um, person. It's, it's really to be able to come full circle um, and be a storyteller on the side of the camera that I've always wanted to be on the side of the camera. Um, and right now I'm directing Say It Loud, uh, the story of James Brown, a four part docu-series that will air on A&E in 2023. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the journey to be able to continue through my company, Coffee Bluff Pictures, to tell stories that are centered around the culture, around my culture. Coffee Bluff Pictures, the company itself, is named for the area in Savannah where my family uh, has lived for the past 150 years. So the name is very important for me. And the name also helps guide me in the types of stories that I wanna tell and the stories about um, intentionally and unintentionally often dismissed people of color and their heroic genius and what they brought to the American culture. We should also note that you do have a tie to St. Louis. I do have a tie to St. Louis. My husband, Michael Anthony Draper, was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. And then I plopped him and took him to Atlanta. Um, but, but yes, his family, he still has family in St. Louis. And we always have an amazing time when we come back to the festival. Such great support, such um, great love from the St. Louis Film Festival. Well, great. Uh, so I want to mention the fact that the people who are watching uh, on Inventive uh, can certainly weigh in on this conversation. You're welcome. In fact, you are encouraged to ask questions and offer comments. 
uh, both in general about the topic of Blacks in cinema, but also if you have questions specific to uh, one of the films that was part of Soul Cinema, uh, absent Voodoo Macbeth, we don't have any representative of Voodoo, Voodoo Macbeth, so probably best not to ask a question about that. <laughs> but if you have one for one of the filmmakers who are present on the Zoom, uh, great, we'd love to hear from you. In fact, as I say, we'd love to hear from you. So, um, but let's start this first uh, to offer a little context. Let's go back into the past. We want to talk about Blacks in cinema from a contemporary perspective, but I think we first need to explore what the history of Blacks in cinema is here in the U.S. And uh, we couldn't have a better person to talk about that than Devotney Lawrence. So Devotney, I'm going to offer you a tremendous challenge in, you know, a relatively brief amount of time. Give us a capsule history <laughs> of blacks in cinema yeah i saw you throwing down that gauntlet then uh, i appreciate <laughs> it uh, we're gonna do the best we can and uh i want to i want to talk about this in two ways and and not to suggest that never the two shall meet because they definitely do uh first i want to look at this in the context of of kind of hollywood mainstream hollywood cinema and what has been done to Blacks and African Americans early on in the history of Hollywood. First and foremost, one of the things that I always tell my students is that let's understand that cinema has always been political, always. Uh, one of my pet peeves is that is when people say, you know, you try to discuss a film and they say, oh, why are you looking at it so seriously? It's just entertainment. And I say, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Films of any genre can be entertaining. We can appreciate them, but there's always more going on than just entertainment. And in that way, the cinema has always been political. So if we go back to cinema, we have to understand that it was initially called the most democratic of art forms, meaning that it cut against, across, excuse me, all social, economic, and gender lines, right? Uh, and, and, and across other lines as well. And as a result of that, there were people who believed the movies had to be relegated, or, or excuse me, regulated. And in regulating them, some of the things that they were worried about were things like sex and violence. But that same concern wasn't really being given to what was happening to Black images and Black people in film. One of the ways in which Black people have always been represented in cinema is, is in one that reflects their second-class citizenship here in this country. When we talk about this early on, this largely comes out of stereotyping. Some of the most prevalent stereotypes that we still hear today were present in the early days of cinema. Now, if we were in a classroom, I would say, now how many of you have heard of these stereotypes? But we're not gonna do that tonight because I can't see you. But I do hope that you do some self-reflection and think about some of these stereotypes that I'm going to mention. If you've ever heard that all blacks can sing and dance, Right? So all Blacks have rhythm. All Black people love watermelon. All Black people love fried chicken. All Black women are sassy and attitudinal. Black men are violent and dangerous. Black people are stupid, unintelligent, so on and so forth. If you've ever heard any of those things, understand that they connect back to slavery, then into minstrel shows, and then they cross over into our cinema, therefore making it political because Blacks were presented as one of five types early on that a scholar named Donald Bogle calls the Tom, the Coon, the Mulatto, the Mammy, and the Buck. And embedded in each of these stereotypes, or excuse me, each of these caricatures are some of the stereotypes that I'm talking about. So when we talk about the Buck, we go back to a film like D.W. Griffith's The Birth of the Nation, which is ultimately or actually heralded as a cinematic masterpiece. And certainly it contributed to things like editing, but we would have gotten there anyway. So <laughs> we were gonna evolve, let me be clear about that. But in this film, we see a black brute who is chasing a white woman and he's going to sexually assault her. That is the implication. And therefore that perception that post-slavery black men were now dangerous and a threat to white women was in film. So therefore that was political. In addition to that, the all-natural entertainer, the singer, the dancer. We see this in the form of Bilbo Jangles Robinson, who appears in several films with Little Shirley Temple, tap dancing upon her command, more often than not, and to get her and her family out of trouble with no regard for his Black family, so to speak, right? 
So we see this idea of the talented musician. In addition to that, tragic mulattoes, a term today that is really offensive, that is an allusion to interracial relationships is explored in films like Imitation in Life, both the 1934 version and the version that comes out in the 50s. And it is a warning essentially about black men and white women being in relationships and having sex. That's what it is about. And so we see these tragic figures who would be happy if only if they didn't have what they call a divided racial inheritance. Oh my goodness, they're confused. They're not black, they're not white. What are they gonna do? Where do they fit, right? So don't do that. And more often than not, they suffer in the narratives of these films, right? And then finally, as it pertains to intelligence, we look at this Coon character type, which is really unintelligent, can't speak properly. We see this character in Step and Fetchit's work, he made a number of films, uh, Hallelujah is among them. We see it in Willie Best characterizations uh, in a film like The Littlest Rebel, among others, where they perpetuate the notion that Blacks are unintelligent. I also don't wanna leave out the mammy, the sassy attitudinal overweight black woman who is just angry for no reason. All of these things are just innate, I suppose. And all she does is she loves taking care of her white family for which she works. So this is our stereo, these stereotypes of black people are embedded in these representations and in these films. And in that way, film is political and people are socialized. You start seeing those images repetitively. And there's a segment of, of, of the population that was never around black people. And you start to believe these things are true, right? And they persist and they affect black people socially, economically, and politically. And these representations will overt. And then we transition into a time where representations of black folks becomes covert. And we start seeing traces of these caricatures in more contemporary representations. And we still, as scholars, unpack, argue, and demonstrate uplift, but also when Blacks are still being held back in terms of representations, as well as the opportunities they're given. Now, that's one way I wanted to talk about Black cinema. That's mainstream Hollywood. Now, the other is with the ways, uh, the work that these wonderful filmmakers who are here with us tonight are doing, and that's in terms of documentary cinema. Because the history of our country is one that is ugly, right? When we start talking about Black experiences, we oftentimes receive sanitized, incomplete versions of history. The beautiful thing about the cinema is it has afforded artists like the people who are here with us tonight, Alana, Deborah, and Damien, the opportunity to seize the means of production and recount histories that are oftentimes overlooked or undiscussed that reveal amazing stories. For example, Deborah's film, 20 Pearls, the through line there is community and, 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 and the emergence of this sorority and what it took to, to, to make that happen and how it is sustained. We see community reflected in another way in the Kinlock doc, where we learn about essentially the ravaging of a black community and the dismantling of a thriving black community, right? Which is not necessarily pleasant. And then finally in, in, in Target St. Louis, we come to understand that there have been several atrocities that have been inflicted upon Black people that we have never heard about and would find in some ways unimaginable today until, like Damien says, he connects it to the Flint water crisis in his film, right? So the documentary film then for Black artists allows us to fill in the gaps in our histories because there has been a suppression that has taken place. We like those sanitized stories. We like to talk about Dr. King, but we don't get into the nitty gritty of what Dr. King actually went through. And we definitely don't talk about what happened to King at the end. Remember, he was assassinated for trying to achieve a liberation. And we have documentaries that help us tell that story, right? When we talk about things like the Scottsboro Boys, the liberators, Black World War II soldiers who helped liberate concentration camps. We don't hear these histories. This is what artists are able to do in addition to stories of uplift, right? So I wanna make very clear that it's not all doom and gloom. 
that there's some great things about where we are in this moment and there are some troubling things about where we are in this moment and all of it, whether it's Hollywood cinema uh, and narrative films or whether it's documentary films, non-narrative films, that work is being put in and we're learning about the vastness and the richness. I want to I want to jump in for a second, Professor. I, Please, I think ahead. I think there's one thing that we that we have to think about when you talk about black people eat watermelon, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think we have to look at one of the early films from 1896, yes. and we have to look at Thomas Edison's Waterman eating film, right? Yep. Early film, 1896. Thomas Edison, he made 1,200 films through his studio, Black Maria in New Jersey, right? That's One of those films was capturing two Black men sitting down, eating watermelon, right? And so yeah. Thomas Edison, in his marketing genius, was able to take a machine and show this film in bars and living rooms. He was great. He would hold press conferences in living rooms and saloons and show this film. Black people eating watermelon. Exactly. Right? exactly. And then this film becomes ingrained in people. And, and, and it becomes this thing where Black people love watermelon. But the story was cut, right? Because these were African Americans who were entrepreneurs who were selling watermelon because they were farmers and they had sold in the market all mm -hmm. day long in the heat. Mm -hmm. And they take a minute mm -hmm. to get watermelon, which we all know is hydrating mm -hmm. and refreshing because they had been working. So they sat down, they were eating their own wares because they were sellers in a marketplace. And that piece of footage was cut, but you didn't see the before the frame or the after the frame. You saw the frame where they're down eating the watermelon. And that's the frame that lived on. That's the frame that created this image of black people loving watermelon, but not the image of these two black men being entrepreneurs who owned the watermelon business and was selling watermelons in the market. Absolutely. And, that's I want to add, and, and, and that's fantastic. And I want to add to what you're saying, because in many instances, what people, what we're often not told about our Black experiences on plantations is that there were some slave masters who actually allowed their slaves to sell watermelons while they were on plantations and enslaved. After the fact, after emancipation, the watermelon for some people becomes a source of sustenance and pride, which is what you're alluding to. And Correct. as a result of that, it becomes a way for people to make a living. And instead of taking that and saying, look at what, what Black people are doing and how they're making a living and contributing to society, you take it and you flatten it. And you make this multidimensional thing that's about sustenance and you turn it into a stereotype to further denigrate the people that you once enslaved. Versus the people that were hydrating and actually entrepreneurs. There you go. Because that, that's what they were doing. Absolutely. So, so, but that's the power of cinema, right? That's what Thomas Edison did. That particular piece of film, 1896, create, and it was shown around the United States of America. Around the world. Around the world. And let us not, under, let us not underestimate the power of Thomas Edison, a man who people say the popularity was so, so well known at one point in time that if you put man who invented a light bulb or the light bulb on an envelope and put it in the mail that it would get to Edison. So it, if he was telling you this and showing you this image, there was a level of authenticity that you associated with it because you knew who he was and what he had contributed to society. So absolutely right. Yep. The power but of yet we know how that circulated. Yet Zora Neale Hurston's films, her ethnographic studies in films did not enjoy the same level of distribution and circulation. Exactly. Speaking of that sort of counter narrative, the uh, African-American filmmakers early on who uh, were working at the same time as people like Edison and uh, Griffith, uh, we should talk a little bit about what was known as race films uh, mm -hmm. and Oscar Micheaux especially. 
um, who has a new documentary uh, out on him. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's on HBO Max, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody leap in here. But mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, and then we'll move on. Believe me, we'll, we'll move past, we'll move past the past to talk about the present. Well, you have but, to know your history. <laughs> yeah. but, but let's talk a little bit about Michaud's contributions and others like him. Yeah, I think that when I when I talk about the birth of a nation, I say that, you know, as much as people want to uphold like technological innovations and things like that, as I said earlier, we were going to get there anyway, we would have gotten there. I didn't need an incredibly racist film to, to you know, evolve editing. But if there is a good thing that came out of it, I'm, I, you know, I say that it is the race film movement. And that is that it largely galvanized. This is not to suggest that there weren't Blacks already trying to make films because there were, but it largely galvanizes a Black people to make what becomes known, as you say, as race films, in which, uh, as scholar Anna Everett says, their goal was to plead their own cinematic cause, meaning we're going to show more well-rounded representations of Black life, culture, and identities to demonstrate that we're more than just dancing, watermelon eating, sassy, attitudinal folks, that we are a range of people, right? And so Michaud um, becomes kind of the preeminent race film director, and he makes a number of films. He's the only one to make it through the Great Depression. He makes films like Body and Soul, Within Our Gates, um, and, and, and countless others, uh, and, and makes his last film, I believe, in the 1950s, and it kind of dissolves without much fanfare. Um, and then there were other filmmakers who came out of that period, too. Uh, George and Noble Johnson, uh, uh, who are, you know, race filmmakers, they found the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, and they make a number of films. Uh, the Trooper of Troop K is among those films, um, and, and, and others. And then we get a groundswell of other motion pictures, uh, excuse me, independent Black motion pictures that come up, too. And as you said, uh, Cliff, they're so important because they're operating independently of Hollywood. So they don't necessarily have the same distribution channels that say a D.W. Griffith has. So they were very ingenious in the ways in which they would show their films. There's a great documentary called Midnight Ramble that talks about race films and Midnight Rambles were where they would show films. Sometimes they would get permission from white theater owners to show films at midnight because then the white patrons weren't interested in going. So a black audience would go see these films at midnight and watch the films but sometimes showings in churches um, and in, in, in public halls in municipalities, wherever they could show these films. And Mouchot would travel around uh, all around the country with his films in the back of his car, taking them to different places and showing them. Uh, and so that race film movement is, is really significant and uh, ultimately starts to go under as a result of the Great Depression, the flu epidemic. And, and then you know it, it's very hard to compete with Hollywood. And so they start losing audiences um, to, to Hollywood films as well. So a very significant movement, oft overlooked. And like I said, I'm so glad there's a new documentary on Michaud uh, because he warrants much more consideration uh, and attention. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the filmmakers' own experiences with Blacks in uh, I, I'm curious as to uh, where you first encountered images that sort of reflected your life back at you, perhaps from a distorted point of view. <laughs> it might have been a distorted uh, mirror image, but I'm just curious as to when you were going to movies, uh, what was the first time, what, what are your memories of when you first encountered Black people on screen that you thought somewhat represented who you were? Let's start with Alana. I, so not the movie theater, but I um, I jokingly tell my daughter this all the time. So I have a, a 12 year old and I tell her like, I just, I feel sorry for you because your generation doesn't have like a, a, a Nickelodeon like I had. So I remember coming up in the late nineties and early two thousands and there were nothing but black kids, black teens, like show after show after hour after hour like we stayed in the house on friday and saturday nights because we had shows that um had storylines that reflected the things that we were going through and there is nothing like that that i see on television now like there will never be another 
Disney and Nickelodeon era like the late 90s and the early 2000s because I saw nothing but representation of not only people who looked like me but still within my age range and I, I felt heard and you know this content that my parents deemed you know appropriate for me to watch and I miss stuff like that I miss that the access to that so I do feel very uh, privilege in the sense that prior to me even understanding, you know, how to hold a camera or or being on this side of of storytelling and filmmaking, that I was able to witness that at a very young age. That that's fascinating because that, that would have not, of course, uh, I'm a little older than you, Alana, <laughs> so that would have escaped me entirely. I'm really fascinated. That's uh, where you first encountered sort of images of black people, uh, not on the movie screen, but on television and in uh, uh, the context of kids television. Uh, so that's great. Uh, Damien, what was your experience? Uh, you're muted again. It's always one, Damien, it's always one. <laughs> it's always, I know, right, all right. I'm just sitting here listening to this engaging conversation. Um, <laughs> What um um you know it's 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 a similar situation. I was, it's a couple. It's it's in, it's in phases for me, right? So the first, I would say my grandmother's house, and she had um this old school cornbread Earl and me. I don't know if you ever, if, if everyone if anyone if anyone remembers classic, <laughs> classic, right? I, cl cornbread Earl and me, and that was a story that ref that to me as a kid, and she had it on the VHS. But as a kid, I recognized, I was like, wow, this is like in a neighborhood. This is, and it had something to do with social justice. It dealt with police reform. It dealt with all these things that I was used to the formula of film being in a three act structure and a happy ending at all the times and things. And it also, it also kind of reflected, you know, people of not of my community, uh, these stories that I used to see. So when I watched Cornbread Earl and me, I was like, wow. And I saw what happened. I'm like, yo, this could happen or be a part, be happen to someone that I that I know, my uncles, because I, I was I was still a kid and it was a VHS, but I still remember that film like very vividly and I watched it a million times. But then when it and then when we go in phases going into the movies, um, and then able to see like uh the five heartbeats. You know, music uh, of, of music that I loved, and and, and I saw them all like that 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 scene when everyone stand in the house and when they see the music in the first at the first when I hear the music on the radio for the first time, and it is two by the foot, two by the headboard. You know how we do it. You know, so those things that had me share a similar life. That's what's going on in uh, on on the big screen. So it's like representation. So then then we had the then we had the genre of of, of the explosion, I say, in, in well, black cin cinema in like the 90s, where, was, where we had Singleton, where we had New Jack City, where we had uh, films that represented us a lot more, you know, that's happening with Boys in the Hood, Menace Society, Inkwell, um, all the, the Killer of Sheep, if you knew about, if you want to get into those whole type of, it, it was stories that were coming out that I was just like blown away. I was consuming it like, you know, a gremlin after 12 o'clock, you know, it was my thing. I love, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a movie's head and a cinephile. So it really helped me get through things. And I kind of want to circle back uh, a little bit on what you guys were speaking about uh, earlier about representation and, and, you know, film, in my opinion, no matter when it came out, even if you look at like World War II was full of propaganda, full of propaganda. And, 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 and the right had a, had a lockdown on how they came across and how they targeted certain things with their films and their storytelling. And, 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 and I say American cinema kind of picked up on how some of the stuff came out about, you know, a population that they weren't in favor of. Because I can remember my earliest days of traveling abroad, me having to combat several stereotypes that was like hung around my neck when I touched down in a foreign land without me saying a word and then having a conversation with someone and they're like, oh, wow. Oh, you're not like what I thought it was going to be because they had already formulated this idea of what American black um, young men were uh, from watching television, watching film, watching movie and those, you know, super masculine menus that, 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 um, that Elders Cleaver spoke about it, they, that they associate with us. Um, that was projected out 
And, you know, and I had to come back there when I traveled. So, you know, cinema is very powerful. Uh, storytelling is extremely powerful and, and, it can, and it's like a hammer. You know, you can use a hammer to build a house or use a hammer to harm someone. So uh, that's, you know, I just wanted to touch bases on what y'all were speaking about earlier as well. Um, Deborah, yeah, how about you? I'm kind of like Damien. I, 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 it was in pockets, right? You know, there was just kind of the early phase that I saw when I was a kid and I didn't really understand what I was watching, but I was watching blackness and it was important to see it. And, and then I saw Boomerang. It was all she wrote. And, and you, got, you guys know I had a long advertising career. So it was Robin Givens. She had that powder blue suit on in front of the elevator and she's facing and she turns around really slowly and Eddie Murphy sees her and I'm like, oh my God. And, and it was in that moment, you see black executives in marketing and advertising and Robin Givens is cold in that suit. She's got the briefcase and the heels. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna work in marketing. And I did, that's, that's, how, that's how impressionable, right? Like in, in Boomerang, you know, I don't know. It's, it's just something that I loved and I loved seeing them around the boardroom table. I yeah. love seeing them making those decisions. I love seeing them doing those advertising campaigns. It, you know, it, and of course there, there was Spike, I, you know, I was, I saw his original student thesis. Um, and, and then of course the moment you know, school days came out. I was singing, I was dancing. I was like, you know, following Jasmine Guy in the song, the whole nine yards. It, it, it was transformative um, to Damien's point when we saw Spike and John and everybody come out all at one time. And, and then even now, when I look at what D. Reese did with Moonlight or what Barry, what Barry, and what Barry did with Moonlight and what D. Reese did with Mudbound, this, the beauty of what they presented, I, I was still eating it up just in true fangirl mode because it was so beautiful. The storytelling was great and it was relatable, but there was power in the storytelling and, and their uh, craft and their aesthetic defies the stereotypes of us not being able to deliver that level of filmmaking. Yeah. So. For, for that, I'm like so grateful for them to really break through with this cinematic genius. But yeah, I'm in phases. I'm in the phases when I was 12. Like I still to this very day watch Mahogany. Like I'm like Dinah Ross, Lady Sings the Blues, Mahogany all day long, Diane Carroll and Claudine. You can't not watch cor Cornbread Earl and Me. And I have to tell you, not that, that I wanted to be these guys, but I still love Car Wash. So, oh, you know, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Be, mainly because of the Rolls Royce soundtrack, but, <laughs> but. But, look at, but look at House Party. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Reggie Hull, like, like House Party, like House Party. Hudlin Brothers, period. The Hudlin Brothers, Brothers all the way out, you know, all the way out. You like, And we what? should note that the Hudlin Brothers are from and East St. Yeah. Louis. East St. Yeah. <laughs> well, everything about House Party was right. Every, everything about that first house party was amazing. Everything about the Hudlin brothers, but um, I, 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 Damien and I share a specific aesthetic because I'm about the inkwell as well. So there's, there's a, um, but, but these films told us not only that we could make films, but they helped us understand that we as African-Americans are dimensionalized. We're, we're not one single type of anything. Exactly. Our experiences, our lived experiences capture a whole world just like anyone else's. So being able to have that variety of things to see and different filmmakers, you remember the Hughes brothers, like everybody was out there making all these exactly. films and it was so exciting. I was in love with Love Jones. I was just in love with everything I was watching, like literally. Um, and, and Spike Lee's World War II film, Miracle at Santa Ana. That that I was like, this is superb. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what got me excited. 
Well, you gave people also lots of things to seek out if they haven't encountered them previously. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, now return to Navani. Navani, you're probably a little bit older uh, than the folks here. And you also have the academic perspective because you also uh, have obviously written extensively about black exploitation. And then just before black exploitation, the sort of it's not the first major African-American star, but uh, we should note Sidney Poitier, who, of course, died in January. You start with and love, Lilith and the Fields. Yeah. I mean, those are, I and I'll ask this to the professor, do you consider to serve with love and Lilith of the Field? I consider that Black cinema. Do you? Um, you know, I, that that's a good question. I I really don't. Um, but that's not to take away from the significance of those films or Mr. Poitier, who, who was just wonderful, who I, I loved, I valued, I adore. Um, I think that largely because of the ways in which films were, were marketed at that point in time and conceived of, uh, Black audiences were the gravy. Um, so you know, like they were, they were essentially made for white audiences, and as a result, there are certain places that those films don't go that for me to say like, yes, it's just, it's black cinema, which still is even a tricky thing to, to, to say, right? Um, I, I would say no, but they were the films that black people needed at that point in time. And he was the person we needed, if that makes sense. And I, and I think that whether from a marketing perspective or from a from an um, screening zip code perspective, where these were shown, I think the level of blackness and sophistication that Sir Sidney Poitier brought to the film made it his own. And, and so anybody that watched it got to understand and watch stereotypes just crush and fall away in the minute he was on screen. Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's it's almost impossible not to not to appreciate something about yeah. Sidney Poitier's performance. Even if you just say, okay, I don't like the film, or maybe he's not, I just think that he was so dynamic. He was so good that there's just, I don't think you can help but connect with him, even if you want to resist him. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I just think that he was, he was so special and such a legend and, um, yeah, I, so you know, I, I would I would say he definitely made those films his own films, um, and you know I think that unfortunately, you know the thing that happened to to, to Super Sydney um, was that you know there was that segment of the population that felt like you know outside of something like um, um, Blackboard Jungle that he didn't connect with say um, middle to, to to maybe lower status or no, lower class blacks. And they, they wanted him to be in that world too. Um, and one person can't be everything for everyone. And well, so isn't they, that Uptown yeah. Saturday night? Exactly. Well, right? Saturday. And some people yeah, Uptown, let's, do, let's do it again. Yes. You know, call it. But you know what? And, and it is so funny, like we was talking, singing uh, Sydney's praises. Mm -hmm. um, um, Mr. Mr. Portier, let me make sure I'm correct with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no first name here. Uh, um, um, even his his decisions as an actor, even when it's not in the script, can can re, can can resonate a lot mm -hmm. on someone. And mm -hmm. for example, the heat of the night smack. Yeah. That smack with it represented so much for me <laughs> as a young man watching that, and then learning about it, uh, then learning about how it wasn't in the script. And how it was said he gives a stern look after this man gets slapped by another man. It didn't seem like a reality to me. Mm -hmm. And I learned, and, 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 and it wasn't a reality. So, and that's why, and that's yeah. why he portrayed it and the power that that took for him to make that stance, make that artistic decision and be bold enough to follow it through. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it seemed like it was so fast. It seemed like it was instinctual. It yeah. was straight up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, that man got hands. That was quick. He's full uh, on character. He's full in character. Full in character, but it helped, it, but it empowered me mm -hmm. as a young man. So that's why representation is so important. Mm -hmm. Like, and once I saw that film and I saw what happened, I'm like, wow, it get it it, it, it it's another piece that you can put in your arsenal that you can yeah. you can you can weapon you can weapon your weaponize yourself on up when you mm -hmm. walk out the door. 
And, yeah. and something I watching something like that man standing up for himself helped me as I walked out the door to deal with. Yeah. Call me people. Mr. Tibbs. Yeah. You know? The sequel. Yeah. And, I, and I would say that I, I I absolutely agree when we when we say like oh and but he Poitier made Uptown Saturday Night and let's do it again. Mm -hmm. He did. I think that that part of the problem like um, with those films is that by the time he made those films and finally went there, we had black exploitation cinema. And people were used to seeing much more gritty, raw films. And that's not to dismiss those films, because again, it's about range. And one of the reasons he makes those films was he recognized what studios were doing with black exploitation and said, no, we gotta, we gotta challenge and transform and change. Yeah. And so that's what he's trying to do. But that whole kind of, if we could say black power generation, they they weren't about that life. They 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 didn't want the comedy to group, they wanted shaft, <laughs> right? Like. Uh, and so all of that gets really murky and complicated too. And well, it's, it's a fort. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. You go because I this is a, this is a question for the professor and his research that I have for him. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to hear your question now. <laughs> well, well, I, well, I, well, I ask the question very specifically um, be, because you said the Black Power Generation wanted to see Shaft right because you've got hyper black masculinity on on the screen but in that period that becomes black exploitation professor are these films good for black women oh well no i mean i think that, that is that is one of the, the, the criticisms <laughs> of black exploitation cinema um, is well okay, and let me let me be clear. Um, particularly the early films, when we're talking about Cotton Comes to Harlem, Shaft, mm -hmm. you know, Shaft's girlfriend I think is on camera for 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 fifteen. I counted this one time, and I can't remember like fifteen <laughs> seconds or something. The next thing you know, they're making love, right? They're in, and and she's just there to uphold black masculinity. And these films are really about, in large part, reclaiming black masculinity because of the assault, right? The unfortunate thing is, is that women, they're, they're incredibly misogynistic until we get Pam Greer into, into the fray, right? And, and she's working for a, a B studio in AIP, which, so it's kind of like, well, why is she always naked, right? So that's complicated. But the one really is when we get to Mr. Mary Dobson in Cleopatra Jones, uh, the formal model, uh, statuette. Six, one. Um, like, mm -hmm. You know, Howdy champion. like James Bond. Yeah. She that film is very good for any Christy Love. Right. Christy Love. Like, Christy Love. Christy Love on TV, right? Yeah. So when we get there, we see some pushback later in the movement, and certainly not as many of those films. And so that that is one of the knocks. And they're also incredibly, they can also be incredibly homophobic as well. Um, and so when I talk about black exploitation, it's not to say that it's any better or worse than anything else, but it's to acknowledge that there was this significant moment in Hollywood where blacks mattered. I mean, Shaft saved MG MGM from going bankrupt. Well, well, that's what I was gonna say, and this is where I where I push I push back on it. Mm -hmm. Blacks mattered. That was only a box office matter, right? I don't I don't know if that was if that was a matter in terms of someone really, you know, doing focus groups to see if that's truly how we wanted black power to be typified. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know, Professor. I, I think literally, Shaft, what Shaft did was allow shareholders in a publicly traded company to get bigger dividends. That's well, it. well then sweet, yeah. sweet, then sweet badass. Sweet Badass was the, like the archetype, right, for that whole situation to put him to see, like, there's there's Negro pennies out here, mm -hmm. basically. So, yeah. you know, it was indie. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's indie, and they saw the they saw the potential in the situation, and then and 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 they pushed out with a with and, and and pipelined a whole lot of films that may not have seen the light of day if they didn't see the profit and didn't care about the culture at all. So they didn't exactly. care that the they didn't. It, it didn't really care that the some of the films were about the extra long extremities of black men. 
-hmm. and the um and, and, and the films were derogatory to black women and and pimps and, and mm -hmm. pushers and all those things. Now, mind you, with some of these, some of the some of the films that have come out of that genre were, were occult classics. Those are films that we saw representation of our neighborhoods in as well, in a somewhat of a true form. And also seeing, you know, our, you know, the hero- Our directors and actors. Directors has hired a whole bunch of black people and helped mm -hmm. start and jump a whole lot of careers. But you can, I will fall, I will put that in the line as a, in the business model as the horror movies that, mm -hmm. that a lot of stars <laughs> came from back in the day. You know, like that was that was somewhat of the model in which they said it, it's still a way to make a profit. Who cares too much about the culture? Who cares about the art of it? Unless the art is an indie grindhouse genre, then you then you're allowed to play within that element, which I like, you know, even see when you see Tarantino and Rodriguez when they jumped in and jumped out. But that's mm -hmm. a whole world mm -hmm. that's there. And I and I think that's where the black exploitation film element laid in for us for in my mind was a is, is basically be all be horror films and it it went on you know it, it went on out it, it didn't come back for a reason mm -hmm. like you know how everything circled around that's good that didn't come back for a reason because it was it was you know i don't think it was always with the best intentions mm -hmm. uh you know when it you know when it came to us and and it can't be for us if it wasn't you know you know, with the best intentions when it came to storytelling. And I don't think too many of those films were, were financed by us, by, by, by people of color. These were, these, these were like, you know, studios making Negro pennies. And they were often written and directed by white men. By white. And, yeah, written, yeah, written and yeah. told through the lens, exactly, told through the lens of, of, of white men. So exactly. You know, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's complicated. No, it's okay. No, no, I, I would just say that and I think the thing about it is, is that, that, that you touch on that, that's, that makes it so relevant. It, first of all, it depended on the studio that was making the film. You know, Warner Brothers releases Cleopatra Jones. MGM mm -hmm. releases Shaft. Warner Brothers releases, releases Superfly. United Artists releases uh, Cotton Comes to Harlem. And, and I don't think there's any, so, any, any um, coincidence that if you go back, Sweetback is a whole, it's a whole other thing. But you know the films that really galvanized that movement are all made by black directors, and and largely wit written by blacks, mm -hmm. and they come from pretty reputable studios, with the exception of Sweetback, which has a low budget porn distributor. Um, so I, I think that we have to kind of say like, okay, there's there are some things going on here, uh, ways in which certainly people jumped on the bandwagon. And then there are some other ways in which there was kind of some significant things because Max Julian, who was a black actor who's in the Mac, wrote Cleopatra Jones. Mm -hmm. And so there were these opportunities that were that were evolving. And it's like, was it a matter of it coming back? Because some people would argue that it did come back in in those hood films in the 19 in the early 1990s, the New Jack Cities, the Boys in the Hood. They would say that's kind of black exploitation 2.0. Um, because it starts one way, and then it seems like everybody's making all these hood films, and it's trying to capitalize. So, and this is not my argument. I'm just saying some people would argue that. Um, and and the other thing is is that when we talk about it, we understand that black people were treated like fads, right? Like they were here one day and they were gone the next. That's what black exploitation is. We saw it again with the hood films. Where are all those films now? And so it's like, is it is it that it didn't come out. back? I'm so, right? so, I mean, they're still here. Is we we watch it, we watch it the hood for life. We're Boys in the hood for life. life. We watch it like every day. We watch all this is is represented. I mean, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Bro. No, no, you're fine. No, you're fine. No, no, no. I think we're in another renaissance, like right now. Uh huh. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the thing about it is, is that because we look at periods like black exploitation, because we look at the hood films. The questions become is always it's never a matter of can we be viable. It's a matter of can we sustain. Will will we be able to sustain? And I think that's the question about the moment we're in right now. There's no doubt we're we're flourishing, and you all know this much better than I because you're working in the industries. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt. But will it sustain, or will I, we be what? And and that's the thing. I I think it, I think the. 
these incredibly talented filmmakers in these Hollywood squares in front of us represent the future and they represent sustainability. But I'm, I'm, I'm rewinding back to the hood films, which I love, like Boys in the Hood and, yeah. and, 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 all, and all of, and all- Boys in the Hood, Minutes Society, New Jack City. I didn't see any of them as black exploitation films. I didn't either. I, I, see, I see the same way as I see Casino, I see Casino uh, as I see Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn, as I see all those, though, uh, uh, even- Scorsese and Oliver Stone, Scorsese, right? This is that whole, that whole crew that they rolled together that sold those type of films of their community in their neighborhood. You mm -hmm. can, see, I, I just, I, I see that in on that level of mm -hmm. storytelling. Cause the thing that made, let's just look at Menace in Society and let's look at Boys in the Hood. These are two of our two premier uh, African-American storytellers. Yeah. You know, they came great. out of that with these two films that could be that can that if someone wants to put it in a block in, in, a, in a box of hood films or neighborhood films, if these are just these films just narrated the story of people who are living in that experience. Now, mm -hmm. if you take these films, if you take these, if you take a film um, uh, in a in a black exploitation area uh, era in which that we I'm trying to pull up with one that's. Because Cleopatra Jones, Shaft, those were the premier leagues, you know, and, and it was not too many of the premier league that came out around mm -hmm. that time. I, I mean, I can I can keep on rattling off films that are, Juice is considered a neighborhood film, you know, the same thing, you know, yeah. all those things. So that's, yeah. I don't think their correlation mm -hmm. really, it just, and this is all my opinion, I don't well, think no, their no, correlation fine. still lives. What'd you say? Well, well, well this is, this is, this is why I would push back on it. I think uh, you see USC educated African American filmmakers making films who are not just uh, making films to uh, solve a studio's, um, you know, bottom line dilemma, but they're bringing their experience and they're meeting their experience with their cinematic prowess, what they learned at NYU Film School or what they learned at USC Film School. So I think they're beginning in that moment at, to use a lived experience and bring that lived experience into craft. And, and, and I think that's what separates them from black exploitation because there's a conscious decision on cameras, on casting, on script, how it's shot, who is cast in it? I think those I think those were very conscientious decisions that were made, not you know just based on you know if a woman had a thirty eight double D, right? So I think the different decisions. And the Godfather of that, the Godfather of that is Spike. You know, nope. Spike helped tell those stories of narratives of Brooklyn, to scare you know, those those narratives of of going to HBCUs, those narratives in which they're like, oh, it's it, you know we see it can happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and that's why we're doing it. Like all you need, the representation is so powerful, uh -huh. you know, because Spike showed us, hey, you can talk about your neighborhood and 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 and, um, and do the right thing and do the right thing. You see what I'm saying? Like you can, oh, you can be set in this area. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm not. I'm hoping, no, I'm, hoping it, I'm not beating a dead horse, but no, I just no, it, think it, like these. The, the, this, this is a live. It's lively. This I is. Think it's, uh, yeah, I, I like. Uh, I like to give Navani an opportunity to say something, and I gotta prod, prod him in the sense that I want you to uh, uh, make a case for Gordon Parks uh, as being somebody that is hugely important in this context with regard to black exploitation. That, that that's kind of what I was gonna say. I think that it's a, it's a complex issue, and certainly a longer conversation than we have more time for tonight. Yeah, I, I think we're time's up. This. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing about it is, is that we have to understand that, you know, Melvin Van Peebles, Ossie Davis, Gordon Parks, they, there weren't really film schools when they were, when they were around, like, that the opportunity that they were going to fill, and if they were, they weren't admitting Black people. And so Gordon Parks is a, is a, is a photographer and, and learns the framing and composition and lighting, the tools. He's a fashion place. photographer. Yeah, exactly, he, right? And a, he, so he has that people. training. Exactly, yeah. right? So, so that makes them a little different than Singleton um, and, 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 and Spike Lee. Um, the other thing is, is that we have to also have to understand that mm. when we start off, when they start making their films, Ossie Davis was actually 
originally cast in Cotton Comes to Harlem, and then he gets to rewrite the script. So there's black input there. He actually wanted to shoot in Harlem. Yeah. There's input there. Melvin Van Peebles had directed for Columbia Pictures, Watermelon Man, in which he had black input but didn't like the system. So then he goes and he puts Black Power Rage in Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. <laughs> Gordon Parks, Shaft. So the things that we're saying that start the movement, that galvanize. So what I'm talking about are the beginnings of the movement. Yeah. And so when I talk about the argument for some people, and again, I said it's not my argument about yeah. good films. Some people, regardless of how we feel about Juice, because I have fond memories of that, some people say, well, it was kind of, you know, boys in the hood that kind of said, let's look at what's going on in places like South Central. And then it was New Jack City. Both those films come out in 91, right? And then not only do we get that, then we get Menace to Society in kind of 93. And then like Juice is one of the kind of later, kind of, they, they don't look at Juice in the same way as they look at those other films. South they look at that as being something more like, something that comes after Shaft trying to pick up on the steam. So we got to understand like the evolution. And again, it's not my argument, yeah. but, and we can like Juice, but when we look at it, some people say, well, what were the production values of Juice versus Boys in the Hood? Who wrote it? What was the input? Certainly, I think there's a lot more Black involvement, but people don't look at that or hold it in the same esteem as they do a Boys in the Hood. And the same oh. thing can be said, like people don't hold some of the later black exploitation films in the same esteem as they do Cotton Comes to Harlem and am, Shaft. Am, am, I, am I clear in here? You, you said that people don't hold Juice and Boys in the Hood in the same esteem? Yeah, and when I say people, I'm talking about like critics and scholars. That's what I mean. Are oh, you saying that but, but Juice yeah. is not held in the same esteem as Boys exactly. in the Hood? Exactly. Yo, I got you. That's, yeah. that's, so that's, they kind of look at that okay. as, they look at that as the product of, of, of uh, like Boys in the Hood and not as, this being at the same level. That's what I mean. I'm going to subtly like <laughs> say something. So I, cause clearly I'm the baby of the bunch, but I'm <laughs> just reading critiques of just even like the, the rush of Tyler Perry films and, you know, him entering the conversation of a different version of Black exploitation, where now it's like he's using these caricatures, he's, he's stereotyping with, so the fine line between when is this literally showing somebody's lived experience because Medea, I had an aunt that Medea literally reminded me of from the height to the weight to her voice to her demeanor. Like that was my lived experience. Mm -hmm. But now I was getting to the point where is he just, I mean, he's a black man. This is his lived experience. These are actually legit stories, but now mm -hmm. he's taking it too far. Like, is he truly going coming in and exploiting the black community? Because it's, now it's getting redundant, right? So to me, it's like it's it's totally subjective. So at what point is it art? Is it showcasing your lived experience through the lens, or now you're just tying on the coattails of what made you famous from your plays now to your screenplays? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I, I think that's a that's a great consideration, right? I'm curious what uh, what are your other uh, what do other people think of Tyler Perry? Obviously, he is a massively successful black filmmaker, uh, and yet I suspect that uh, you don't necessarily embrace him full wholeheartedly. Uh, I'm curious what your reaction. I do. Are. Uh, well, you actually have you worked with Tyler at all? I've never worked with Tyler Perry, but I embrace him fully because he has the right to tell a story the way, be, be, because we don't scrutinize Adam Sandler movies in that way, do we? Oh, I do. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, oh, do. I think there's I, plenty I, of criticism I, with Adam Sandler. I love Adam Sandler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love Adam Sandler. You know, yeah, but you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. I, 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 I think Tyler Perry has the right to get behind the camera and tell whatever story that he wants to tell it and whatever means he wants to tell it. What, what we're feeling and seeing is that we need more. We need yeah. people to have that level of access and platform so that we can tell other stories. But, and, and I just picked on Adam Sandler because for obvious reasons, right? So, so Adam Sandler gets to, to make whatever types 
of movies he wants. Let's let Tyler Perry make whatever he wants. Let's let Alana make whatever she wants. Let's let Damien make whatever he wants. You know, let's let Deborah make whatever she wants. But what I appreciate the most about Tyler Perry is his understanding of his audience. Definitely. Understanding of that market and what the supply and the demand was in order to meet that market's need and to be able to do that across theater and film, I think is rather re remarkable. I think, I think it's incredible. Um, but in, in terms of us sticking a pin in only one person, that becomes the Jesse Owens story. We're only gonna let one person win all the medals. Everybody gets to be on the team. I did a whole film about this, Olympic Pride American Pressures. 18 African-Americans on the 1936 Olympic team. And we remember one man. So we, 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 we get to remember everyone. America likes to give us one magical Negro. We don't, we, we, we reject that. I reject that. I want all the magical Negroes to have an opportunity and a shot behind the camera. No, I, I definitely agree. And, and I'm again, a Tyler Perry fan. Like do I, from the shot, like he got, bank like i'm proud i don't watch all of the content but i'm always going to support what he's doing because he does not wait on a uh, corporate validation he does not wait on the white man's validation he made his own table he made his own studio <laughs> you know what I'm saying? so i'm always going to respect what yeah. he does and so I, I wanted to mention this earlier but just talking about just um the one thing that I admire about Adam Sandler is, you know, he rotates the same actors. Like he brings on, you know, the homies for his films. And so when we talk about like the Robert Townsend's or the Keenan Ivory Wayne's or or the Eddie Murphy's, that's what I appreciate most because Black folks are a communal people. And so when I think about like Boomerang, which I just saw for the first time last year, don't but leave, leave me alone, leave me alone. Beautiful film, like my, my husband's mentor started uh, the Marcus Graham Project down here in Dallas, just based off that movie. So just like life imitating art, art imitating life. But I, I say all the time, like, I don't know if Keenan Ivory Waynes has a star on the Walk of Fame. If he doesn't, like, what the hell? Like, what are we waiting on? He, um, he does? Yeah, I believe he has one. I, I, oh, he better, he better, he better. Like he, I, I think he's so underrated. Um, I, I think the whole Wayne's family entirely is completely underrated, but just it's how just back, and huh? I, <laughs> nothing. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, and I, Marlon's my favorite. Oh okay, God! I keep Marlon <laughs> is my favorite. I love Wayne's brothers is my favorite <laughs> show ever. But just how they they brought each other on, I think like The Wiz is one of my favorite movies. And then when I do research on what they had to go through in order to even bring it. What you know, to that? life, the Wiz. Oh, the Wiz. that's Lamette, right? That is my, that's my movie or how movies are considered classics until 20, like Friday is now being considered a classic. So how it, long it, does it take for people to appreciate the art that we're making um, it, all the way down the line? And you know it, what? The Wiz is a black movie? Is, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Huh? I'm saying, is the Wiz a black movie? If the director's not black, I'm just, I'm just being the devil's advocate. You know what? If that is, 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 is black theme, is black culture, it's black story. I mean, just not having the director be. I'm, I'm messing. I know, no, I'm, I'm really, I want to go into black, black soundtrack, black, black artist, like, like you know, it's one of the, it's, 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 it, and, and really, what is a black movie though? You know, I don't know. We have a professor. That's the real. That's the story. That's that's what I that's what I go back and forth with, right? I don't know. Yeah. Two th two things I wanted to go to to, to 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 bring. Okay, one, what is a black movie, and then also talk about Robert Townsend. So, mm -hmm. what 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 is a black movie? I think a narrative of a of the story that's let's even if it's a community, let's just take Boys in the Hood or no okay. Minister Society or no Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood. <laughs> Boys in the Hood. That's not a black story. That's an American story. That is a that is a neighborhood in in South Central America, South Central Los Angeles, America. That but it's two best friends coming of age. That's it. It's a coming of age story. That's all it is. And but what, couldn't we what, say that for because most all of, all of them? Yeah, I think all of them. So that so that box of black stories or black mm -hmm. films. 
that has been used against us on so many different levels. It's ridiculous when it comes to marketing dollars in and out of the United States. Mm -hmm. so that's true. You know, that's absolutely true. It's very true. Yeah. That might be one of the most uh, 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 d dangerous, you know, uh, um, things you can put on a film. Maybe, maybe because by saying this is a black story, you're basically trying to eliminate part of the population. Honestly, in my well, opinion. well, I think that and, 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 and there are stories. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm wrapping up real quick. But there are stories. That it, it depends on your intention by doing it, right? Get this black story. Like, no, it's a story that's being told that just so happen to have majority or black people in it. We don't look at regular, we don't look at TVs and like, oh, Friends is a white TV show. No, it's a show about these people in Central Perks, this group of friends just hang out. It's funny and we enjoy no, that's it. A, that's, that's a white TV show. But it was watched by millions of people. Yeah, right. so, well, I'm just speaking in general. You are right, my bad. Okay. <laughs> it's not about example, but I'm talking about even if we look, if if, if we watch, just, just look at see what film, uh, any in of oh, oh, Porky's. Look at Porky's, or look at Revenge of the Nerds, or look mm -hmm. at you know all these are just you know don't want, we don't say that this is this no these are frat uh, stories of college fraternities nerds things that are uni things that are universal. Just yeah. when it gets to us is when they, when it, and it's the box that's been, again, it's been, and I tell black stories, you know what I'm just saying, but they use it against us so much. I, I, I dislike it, that's, that's all. Well, I think that the interesting thing is it's, it's not even so much that um, we say, what is a black story? I think even John Singleton would say that boys, would, he, I think he said, like, it's a black film, right? It's about his upbringing and his experience. There's actually nothing wrong with saying that this is a black story. Um, the problem is, is that people tend to think that if they're of another ethnic group or white, they can't go see it. Like that black stories can't be for everyone. So implicit in Friends is whiteness, right? Whiteness is implicit in Porky's. We don't have to say it because um, it's like a scholar Richard Dyer says, whiteness kind of exists as being nothing at all. It's just there, it's everything. And you will even hear, you know, say white people talk and tell a story. And when they're talking about someone who's white, they don't tell you they're white. But when they're talking about somebody at the bar, yeah, and this big black dude bumped into me. And the point is not that the dude was black, unless you're trying to emphasize that he was scarier as a result of. The point is that a big dude bumped into you, right? So it's implicit, just like it's implicit if, if, if you hear that conversation between friends and they don't say it, and then later they do. It's implicit in TV shows because that is the mainstream, that is the dominant ideology. And the way that it's historically worked is, everyone should be watching things like Friends, right? Everyone should watch ER, everyone should watch Grey's Anatomy, right? Because think about it, if, if it was white and people of color didn't watch it, think of how, how out of the loop we'd be in terms of popular culture. Think of everything we'd miss, right? But if it's a story that's perceived to be a black story, and so somebody hasn't seen Boys in the Hood, like, oh, well, they still know about Mad Men and, and, and The Handmaid's Tale and, and all these other things that we hear about much more than that. Ask someone if they've seen Atlanta, right? And see what they say. Well, and if they haven't seen it, they're still in the know. And that's the thing. It's very interesting because as you talk about popular culture, why is it in, and I'm just filled with questions today, why is it that, that that seems to be so problematic in film, but when you talk about popular culture and sports, <laughs> everyone's fine when we talk about, hey. and why when we talk about who's on the top charts on Billboard, we're fine if it's, you know, but in film, in this visual medium, like, Everyone knows Michael Jackson, everyone knows Janet, everyone knows Beyonce, everyone knows Usher, everyone knows Lizzo, right? But if Lizzo's in a movie, will everyone watch it? Will, and, and how will it be marketed? So the idea goes back, Professor, to what you said, films are political. So the visual, the idea of representation the 
physicality of representation has so much to do with othering and so much to do with the very nature of birth of a nation. So when the president of the United States of America in 1915 shows birth of a nation in the United States of America, he sanctions white supremacy mm -hmm. for the country. Absolutely. So the, the dominance is forever etched in the celluloid because the president of the United States ushered it in. Yeah. So that's that answers your question about friends. And, and professor, and then also, I'm sorry, this is to, to address what we just said about, uh, what you just said about the analogy about the, 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 the scenario, I'm sorry, that you put about being bumped into a, it's getting bumped into a, by a big guy. Mm -hmm. Only reason they'll say it's a big black guy mm -hmm. because they're trying to say something about that a big black guy bumped into me, right? I Meaning mm -hmm. that there was an inherently a level of more danger, more mm -hmm. fear, exactly. more, uh, right? So exactly. black film, you see what I'm saying? When you when you look, now, I, now mind you, I'm an advocate for black film and all of the positive elements of the situation and mm -hmm. I champion it. But we have to also understand that, I mean, for me, I'm sorry, and, my, and also in my opinion, I have to understand that they put that marker that they put, oh, this black film, it is there for a reason to put into a, a box or to, or for whatever obstacle they want to put into place. Um, I, I, I saw, um, what's, what's this guy name? Uh, Fred Williamson, mm -hmm. uh, Fred Williamson, right? I saw him do it and, and, this, and this stuck with me. He, he did a talk at a, at, 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 at a, I don't know, was it a festival or something? And he was talking about how being country dumb, playing country dumb, I'm sorry, helped him out when it came to him marketing black films because he was doing all these films that the studio was considering B films, right? Mm -hmm. These B films, but they got niche for it, like OGs, you know, the real old uh, super, you know, back, you know, all those films from at that time period when VHS and Blockbuster was a real market making this money, right? So this brother stood up and said, like, you know, he'd go in there with the studio and talk to them about the film. And they will, and they would, oh, these, you know, oh yeah, yeah, okay, well, they will try to keep the lion's share of the money when it came to the distribution, it came to the licensing, right? Because, uh, because this is what they wanted to do. But he's like, okay, well, then let me get, you know, the foreign rights, you know? And, they, mm -hmm. and because of that black film stereotype, they, foreign films don't sell. We don't sell in over, over there. That's right. That's black right. films, and across, and that's what they want to push. Mm -hmm. So what he was able to do was like, okay, well, let me get that. And then mm -hmm. it was like, oh yeah, we'll write it off to you. I mean, this is how they ignorance, their ignorance worked against them. We'll write that off to you, no problem. We'll give you that, shut you up. And mm -hmm. he said he took those films because he had already laid the inroads and the mm -hmm. infrastructure in Europe by going, doing all the radio, doing all the press and all, also every, all the other things that he's done. When he brought his product to that market, it exp he said he made more money off mm -hmm. those films than the distribution company did because of the back end licensing on the on the on the, on the foreign rights. Mm -hmm. So I mean you, you see what I'm saying? Like those are the things that we have to navigate and move yes. around just because they label that that's yes. black film. It's, it's, yeah. it's that. It's, it's baffling to me that black music, black art <laughs> can exist in Europe, but black film can't. So for practical reason, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it's that they don't, they, they just don't, and, and it is baffling, and Damien, I do, I want to be clear that I was not disagreeing with you. Certainly, the idea of Black film is weaponized against people, and it's just, all I was saying is it's that failure for people to understand that Black stories are also American stories, as you were saying about Boys in the Hood. There, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like Black history. That's still American history, yeah. and we should all be learning it and studying it. And it's the same way with these films. And so I completely agree with you. And I was, I didn't mean to give the implication that I didn't. And I think uh, that we are seeing at least some modest progress in this sense. Uh, you take a film like Get Out, Jordan Peele's Get Out, that crosses all racial lines. Is it a black film? It's made by a black filmmaker. It deals with black subjects in a really serious way, but it's also hugely entertaining. And I don't think any white person is going to say, oh, I'm not going to go see it because it's a black film. Many white people saw it. Do you see that uh, things are slowly 
beginning to break down in that sense, that sort of ghettoization, keeping it, you know, in this box of, oh, it's a black film and therefore it can't break out into a wider culture. Uh, is that beginning to change or is that just, you know, one example and it doesn't mean anything? I think with the example of Jordan Peele, like he, he appeases to white people in general. And so it, it goes back to the intent because black America goes to see Get Out and it's a horror film. White people go to Get Out and it's a comedy, right? And so it, it goes back to the intent of like, uh, why am I going to see this movie and, and what am I getting out of it? And I think um, it, amazing storyteller, amazing director, but Jordan Peele also knows what the hell he's doing. Where the coin you flip it on, or however you look at it, you're still going to see it. I think I think we're in such a great place. One, we get to have this debate, so we get to have this conversation. Um, so, so I think that's already progress. Yeah, I right. think I, th I think the fact that we get to sit here and share our perspective and our POV on something that we all love so much and that we're so passionate about it. And we all come at it at five different ways. The five of us come at the at movies and filmmaking and our love of cinema in five different ways. And all five of those ways are relevant and, and bring something to the party. I, I think that tells us we made progress. Is this little conversation right here, Cliff? You know, 10 years ago would not have been, happened. So we, we have made progress um, to be able to sit here. And I think, I think the bigger progress will be for festivals. And I'm gonna throw this one on you, Cliff, will be for festivals to ensure that um, distributors can come see, you know, Alana and Damien and, and, that, we, and that we take great care of our next generation of filmmakers to make sure that they have distribution opportunities. So they're just not making films, that they come to a film festival and they're in there and there's a, a room that they can go to um, and that and and have the opportunity to have the conversation about rights and to be picked up and to be distributed. I think that's mm -hmm. the next, I think the next place, the talent, the skill set, the ability to tell stories, that's not even a discussion. Like we, we have so many amazing filmmakers of all races, creeds, colors, genders, and sexual orientations. The parity and the equity comes in the ability to make a living and the ability to make money and the ability to sustain a career. That's that's our next conversation. I wanted to, to, to veggie back on what Deborah was saying um, to just the, the broadness of the industry as a whole, right? So myself personally, I have no desire to be in Hollywood. Like I'm not attracted by it. I don't, I, I personally don't have a desire. I love the indie space. I love the nonfiction world. Um, and it was this opportunity that allowed me to learn about educational distribution, like the different formats of, of distribution, how I'm able to sustain myself personally in, um, you know, being able to make a film like Kinlock was made for $40,000, which in industry terms, like is very, 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 very low. But I was able to do what I needed to do to get to the next level. And so that access and, and opening of the barriers for a first time filmmaker with no industry connections, right? With no previous experience, with no film degree and to be able to do this. So I think we have made great headway into doing stuff like that. And I think about like the series Bel Air that just came out and those directors like, you know, from, from Kansas City, from Midwest, like the, the original concept was just an, an idea mm -hmm. that they hoped would get picked up and it ended up getting picked up. So people, the access, the, the cinematic iPhones that people are able to create amazing content and with social media, um, I think that is, it is starting to level the playing field for the everyday creator to come in and create um, film in any format that they want to. So to answer your question, but yes, we are we are making great strides. But when it comes to like equity, and and I don't want just exposure. Like I I still have a nine to five. Like I, I work in tech by day and, and as a creative at night because I have a family to support. And I know I was told from the very beginning, if you're trying to get into the doc space to make money, you in the wrong, you in the <laughs> wrong field. But I'm I'm learning ways to you know by doing speaking engagement by developing the curriculum and licensing out to universities and colleges. Like people are teaching me the ropes 
to where I can still make it an educational and entertaining moment while teaching other young minds how to create content at 14, at 15, at 16 years old. And, and Alana, don't let anyone tell you that. That's, 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 not, that's not the actual right direction and that's not the right advice because Ken Burns has made a really good living for the past 30 years and so has Michael Moore. So- a whole cut named after him. You are absolutely right. Yeah, don't, don't even expect that advice. Don't and, expect that. and so has uh, Stanley Nelson. Uh, and so uh, has Stanley Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> and so has Sam, and Sam Pollard. But but, mm -hmm. I, but I'm, I'm just saying in terms of of someone that is a name that people recognize in the in the doc space. Ken Burns yeah. is a name that people recognize in that doc space. Um, so don't accept that. There are so many ways that you will be able to create a life for yourself and and go create it. But don't listen to that. That's rubbish. I received that. All good. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we do have some questions from the audience, but now we're running out of time. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, let's see. I know a it's, lot of questions here. Let's see. Let's play one. audience. We so immersed in the conversation. Oh, yeah. I know, and I'm like, I have to pop. It's like it's late here on the east coast. <laughs> uh, okay, Let, let's end with this question from Neil Weeks. With all this in mind, how does this shape how you all show up as filmmakers? What narrative do you want future panelists to have when they talk about your contribution to the story of blacks in film? Mm. Do you have a good question. Now read that question again. <laughs> uh, well, let's say the core of it is what narrative do you want future panelists to have when they talk about your own contributions to the story of Blacks in film? So basically, where does the present moment leave us? What what are you going to be able to contribute to sort of broaden the, the discussion and to uh, further um, the, the idea of Blacks in film as being something hugely right. important? I tell you this. I, I, I to answer that question from my from my viewpoint, I kind of take it back to what I was going to talk about Robert Townsend beforehand, right? So Robert Townsend to me was so he, he, the brother Hollywood Shuffle was so impactful to show on so many different levels. Not even just let me know what like a real mockumentary was back then before <laughs> like the guest stuff came out, you know, and all those things. But uh, to show like you can you can. Two brothers can just hustle and make this happen. If you him and him 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 and the Wayans, you know him him, him, <laughs> him and the man, the OG Wayans, were, uh, got together and created something from a straight indie budget, using your credit cards, sacrificing, knowing that you it was a common goal put together can make it happen. So th that in turn, kind of what I want, you know, uh, a panel to discuss about my work is like, hey, he was able to make this in the indie space or make this and create this from f with all these obstacles that's put in place without with, I mean, by any means necessary that this work got done and put across and the story and these narratives were told. So I, I, I will hope that a, a future panel will be like the indie filmmaker, you know, how to make it, how to make, how to, how to make sure nothing says no to you or make, nothing stops you. You know, something along those lines, because I, I, I appreciate that what, you know, with that brother did, because he put that in me, you know, by watching Hollywood Shuffle and then seeing Meteor Man. Like, no one talks about that was a superhero movie that that man put together by himself and he's flying around with three feet off the ground. You know? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> talks about Nobody Meteor Man. Nobody talks about me and Meteor Man. That man was pushing the line over there. He, nobody was black, doing black superheroes. He pushing the line over there in the neighborhood. So I, you know, that that's that's what I would like, you know, a push the line panel, you know, to discuss <laughs> things about them and filmmaking and storytelling, you know, that type of thing. My tagline is I, I highlight underrepresented people, places, and spaces because I, I come from the lens of the art of documentation. And I, I feel like for so long the narrative amongst the black community has always been created for us. Um, that I want people to understand the importance of documenting from where you are. And so not only am I a filmmaker, I am a photographer. So I was a storyteller for Humans of St. Louis as well. And stamping like important moments in, in time from your lens, right? And you don't have to wait on 
um, an industry connection. You don't have to wait to have all the resources. You can use your phone right now to go to your grandfather's house and document him. I'm, I'm witnessing what's happened with Genius you know, on Netflix right now, shout out, like, forget Kanye, shout out to Cootie, like, the, the yeah. foresight to be able to, to have, like, you know, know the story is there, you don't know what it is yet, but you just know it's important enough that I'm, I'm just gonna keep the camera rolling, mm -hmm. but you know how much dedication and, and money that takes, right, and so I, he is the genius of that story, and, and that's what I want people to get out of content like that, everybody talks about Kanye, but, like, 20 years worth of footage, that he just got 30 mil for when he had no, the awareness i don't i don't know where this is going but i know it's important enough so finding values in the everyday underrepresented people places and spaces that you walk by every single day right now because not to say that you'll get 30 million in the future but you just don't know what it'll produce in the future i didn't know he got 30 million for that footage that's amazing <laughs> right um, <laughs> I think, you know, in the future, when folks look back at my canon of work, um, I, I want it, what will be most important to me is that they're able to say that I approach storytelling of important and lesser known and maybe not even important Black people and their lived experiences across time, whether it was the Black models in France. And, and that they know that I travel to capture stories. I shot in Germany, I shot in France, African-Americans breaking boundaries and that I brought those lives to the screen so people can know them, recognize them, respect what they did and honor them and ensure that our proper place in history is remembered. All right, well, that's a, a great place to end it. Uh, we have had tremendously positive feedback to this conversation, by the way. Oh. Uh, not a single person who signed on has left. Every, every person has hung on through the entire hour and a half. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the audience uh, came from uh, multiple people. You were all such great creators. They are honored to be a part of this discussion. So thanks to you all. We very much appreciate your willingness to participate. And we uh, wanna offer one last thanks to ARP of Missouri for enabling all of this. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Nice to, meet you. nice to meet you guys. Nice, nice to meet nice you too. Too. Great conversation. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. I appreciate you all. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, Cliff. Bye, Cliff. Peace, brother. All right. Thank you. Hey, Damien. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, Cliff, can I ask? Hey, Damien. So the other thing I was going to tell you is that. Hold on, wait, uh, wait, Cliff, are we still live? No. Okay, go for it. So you talk about Cornbread Earl and me? Yeah. You know, I, I, I love it. Got that. Got it on DVD. You know, I view that as a superhero film. Cornbread Earl was a superhero, man. Super. Hey, let, oh, let me break something down to you, bro. <laughs> I had the blessing to have to been to been hired to rewrite the remake of Cornbread Earl and me. Is that right? Yeah, so I wrote it. I, I wrote it, passed it back to the producers. We had like three different, I, I did three different versions of it. Mm -hmm. um, dude, uh, if they, he is a superhero. He right. And, and, and what'd you say? He, I, I just said right, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then if you, I, I, I really hope that this get made because uh, I would love for you to see what I deal with of being that superhero. Because yeah. I get, because I, because one of the issues with the film that I, if, if I had to look for the issues, is that I had to, like, he had, to, I wanted him to be more of a human. Yeah. So I put him, I, I wanted them to know that they were cutting down basically a Jesus character. Yeah. That's so a, you're that's, cutting down the Jesus of this neighborhood. That's exactly it. To show you the fallout after that. That's the, that's the angle that I took it. But I wanted to show that this was a whole man, a human, because it showed the whole, a whole young man with great values that you took from the neighborhood and the community. That's so yeah, nice I, nice. yeah, like and he's a superhero ish character. So yeah, man, yeah. I can't. I, yeah, you're 100 right, bro. I love that. <laughs> right on, man. It was great to meet you, man, and keep doing your thing. Thank you. Uh, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and take care. I love to stay in touch, man. I would love to stay in touch. So yeah, absolutely. I think we're all on the email thread, right? Okay, yep. you've all got each other's emails. I'll, um, I'll send you my. I'll send you my number, man. You can text. Please me do so. But where, where are you at? I'm in Iowa. I'm in Ames, Iowa. I'm in Iowa State University. 
Oh man, listen, I travel around all the time, you know, with the shooting. Okay. So look, hey, I'm always around, brother. So I would okay. love to ch check in with yeah. you. Basis. Well, if you're ever in Iowa, man, you got a spot. So just, sure. just let me know. Thank you, brother. Uh, Let's talk some movies, man. I love talking movies all day, all night. And you and me both. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right my good people. All right, Cliff. Thank you. Thanks man. a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, Cliff.